Okay, we're going to get started with the presentation from Caltrans on State Route 46 update. Good evening. Everything working? You guys can hear me okay? There you go. Okay, my name is Neil Bretz. I'm project manager for Caltrans, and I'm going to give you a quick, uh, brief update on what Caltrans is doing on Route 46. Okay, what you see on the screen now, this is the Route 46, basically from Highway 101 over in San Luis Obispo County at Paso Robles, um, heading east over to I-5 in Kern County. So we've been working on this corridor for several years. Um, the corridor in, in San Luis Obispo County is, on, is run by or controlled by our District 5 over in San Luis, and the Kern County is all by District 6 out of the Fresno office. So in the Fresno office, we've been working on this corridor for over 20 years now. Um, our major goal is to convert the, the original two-lane highway to a four-lane expressway and or four-lane conventional highway to improve safety and capacity of the route. So you can see on the, on the map you're up there right now, the green signifies the, the project segments that have been completed in construction. Um, the orange is the, signifies uh, projects that are now in construction, and in the purple are projects that are in the um, environmental and design phase. Actually, in, in San Luis Obispo County, that um, four segment that was orange actually just got completed about a month or two ago. I was just just driven over there a couple weeks ago, and it's all completed, so it's very nice. And the two projects in the purple are progressing very well, and they should be out in construction in the next uh, probably two to three years. Moving over on the Kern County side, um, we've completed three segments, one, two, and three. And um, the orange section over at I-5, the interchange, we're working on that right now. That's segment 4B. And we're in the process of developing um, the fifth and final segment in Kern County, segments um, 4B. Um, actually, it's through the Lost Hills area and the oil fields. So again, this, this map just breaks down um, the segment in Kern County, as I mentioned. We completed the first three segments. Segment one was completed back in November of 2011. Segment two was actually completed a month early in October of 2011. And the middle segment three was completed in January of 13. Um, so back on this, um, the, the original corridor, as I mentioned, we worked on this. We started back in about 1999, roughly. So a little over approximately 20 years we've been working on this corridor um, through Kern County. Um, we completed our environmental analysis back in June of 2005, and then we segmented the projects for construction. Um, this whole corridor in Kern County is roughly a little over 33 miles from the county line all the way down to I-5, just east of I-5 is where we, this particular corridor ends. As I mentioned earlier, our main goal of this, for this corridor was to widen to either a four-lane expressway or a conventional highway. Mainly the conventional highway is going through the community of Lost Hills and through the area at I-5 where the truck stops are. Um, to make that a full expressway would be too disruptive to the local businesses in the area. Let me see if we get there. And this is pretty much the information I just went over a little bit. So moving on to segment 4A. This is the project that's currently in construction at the um, I-5 interchange. We began construction in March of 2018. We anticipate completing that in basically fall of 2020. And then segment 4B, which is um, our fifth and final project, is now in design. And we began the design in March of 2018 and we anticipate starting construction in March of 2021. So moving on, this is a little more details on the project that's in construction right now. You can see the map there. Um, it's a fairly short project, a little, little less than two miles. Um, very complicated project because it's dealing with the interchange at I-5 
and also the, the commercial area, area just to the west of I-5, which is several truck stops, restaurants, and hotels in the area. So it's a fairly complex project to construct um, as we have to keep all, the, all access to the businesses open at all times. <clears throat> Basically, on segment 4A, we're going to continue the widening through that area, four lanes. Um, we'll reconstruct the interchange at I-5, um, realigning the ramps, adding two new uh, loop ramps in each direction. We're going to be adding a couple new county roads that connect the existing roads that you see there, both north and south of I-5, to improve local circulation. Um, because we're going to be, as part of this project, we're going to be adding a raised concrete median through the business area, which will help facilitate or and actually improve the operations to that area. But it will limit some of the movements that are there right now as far as crossing 46. Um, the only be able to cross 46 in the, in the future at the two inter intersections in that area. Um, one big improvement we're doing to 46 in that area in the business district is it's all going to be concrete to eliminate um, um, continual maintenance of that area. But the large trucks, they tend to destroy our pavement fairly quickly. So the concrete will make a, give a lot longer lasting, um, uh, improve the longevity of the pavement in that area for quite some time. And we'll keep our maintenance folks out of the area and keep the, the traffic flowing much smoother. We're also going to add a couple right turn lanes in the area to facilitate the large trucks moving in and out of the um, truck stops in that area. And as, as I mentioned earlier, the con we anticipate completing this in the fall of 2020. Feel free if you have any questions, you can interrupt any time if you N Neil, I have a, a quick question. Sure. If it's okay with the chairman. Sure. The, the um, Gail has reported previously that w there was some right-of-way issues with PG&E. Have those been resolved? Um, we got PG&E. To my knowledge, we have. We um, the only concern now, and actually we PG&E subbed out some of the, there were some vaults there we had to relocated. So PG&E, because they didn't have sufficient staffing to do it internally, they subbed it out to have the vaults moved by a subcontractor to help expedite that process. Our only concern now is that work was, to my knowledge, is all completed. So just making the final tie-in by, by PG&E forces. So that's either has just been completed or is due within the next week or so. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that's going to be done on schedule. Thank you. Um, and something, I'll give you one more thing to add to that. We, we've had a, a lot of issues out there with right away in, in condemnation actions, and we just now, or just about a month ago, got our last order possession for property. So that was a big concern of ours. It was that one of the county roads to the south, the property owners were, were delaying us through the court process, but we were able to get the order possession, so we don't see any future delays now. So we're moving forward with construction. So pretty much covered all this information, the details of what's what the actually Sigma 4A is going to be doing. Can I, can I jump in there for a second? Sure. Tell me again the uh, estimated completion date. For Sigma 4A? Yes. We're looking to complete that in, let me back Did you say here. fall of 2020? Yes, fall of 2020. Okay. Could Thanks. be a little sooner, but I don't want to commit to that. But we're on schedule for that at the latest. We should be done. So I've covered all this information. Now we'll move on to segment 4B. This is, like I mentioned, this is our fifth and final project in this corridor for Kern County. Um, we began designing this project in March of 2018. Um, we anticipate start of construction in March of 2021 anticipate construction to be completed in the fall of 2003. Um, our funding sources for this project, um, the Federal Bill Grant Program, and this is directly, we can thank Kern Cog for this, this funding. Um, this was a great effort on their part to secure this, this funding for this project. 17.5 million for, will fund part of the construction activities on this project. Um, the good thing is, as I mentioned, we got the money for the for construction. Um, the flip side, which is usually happens with federal money, is there's purse strings tied or there's strings attached to that money. It, it forced us or was forcing us to increase our or advance our schedule. So it's it's um, 
given us some challenges that um, we weren't anticipating initially with this project. So we cut off over a, a year off of delivery of this project. So we're working to um, trying to find some innovative ways to get this project delivered. Um, because of the money, it, it um, as I mentioned, the strings attached to it require us to obligate the funds by a certain time, which means we have to advance some of our design, mainly that's our right-of-way acquisition is our controlling factor. But we're, uh, and I'll cover some more details how we're going to achieve that. Along with the federal grant, the bill grant program, we also have demo funds, the 17 million. This is the last remaining pot of demo funds in this quarter. I think we started off with over 90 million back on the original um, demonstration funds that were given this quarter several years ago. And yeah, then we'll add something? also have uh, some um, additional STIP RIP funds, which those funds are controlled by Kern Cog, and then STIP IP funds, which are interregional funds controlled by Caltrans. Neil, can I, can I add, uh, the, the, s the $17 million is, is from the grant uh, from Bill Thomas from 2005, and the $17.5 million is the grant that uh, Ke Kevin McCarthy assisted right, that was with. that was recently, that the 17.5 that we call the federal bill grant was just awarded to Kern Cog back in December, so it's fairly recent, and that's a new, that's a program that the feds have that they go through cycles every you know, two to three years, and they, they look for projects that are nearing, they're getting ready for construction, and they'll send out a call for projects. The COGS throughout the country go and apply for this. This project is one of only three projects in the state that got this bill grant money. So it's, it's a big challenge to get the money, so I really thank the COG for making the, made a tremendous effort to get this, this money for the project. And, uh, well, we, we have a representative from Congressman Car McCarthy's office here today, too. Great. Well, we certainly thank you. Was, uh, it, Ms. Senator Com uh, McCarthy was instrumental in, in securing those funds. So, can I ask a question about that? Sure. <clears throat> Isn't that aren't those the funds that are at risk if we don't perform? Correct. In a certain, and what's the timeline that the you need to have your property acquisition? Is it totally done or the predominantly done? What's the timeline requires us to obligate the funds by the end of the federal fiscal year, which is September of 2020. So in order for us to do that, we need to have the project in a ready-to-advertise um, state, basically, which means typically we need to have our right-of-way certified. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have possession of all the right-of-way. That means that we've gone through the process and a little hard to explain, but we, we have the process, we have the funds or the right of way secured, we don't necessarily have the order of possession for the property. In other words, that can be delayed through the court process, it can be delayed several months. But we do, because we go through condemnation, and that's usually what happens, we're going through the condemnation action. Once we've done that, that allows us to certify the project, but that based on it, and then once we've done that, we usually get a, we can get a timeline as to when we actually will have the physically have the property in our possession. So I would be interested <coughs> in, maybe not right now, but if you providing me with a, a timeline of the milestones that need to be um, met mm -hmm. along the, between now and completion. Certainly. Okay. We can certainly give you that. It's it's fairly simple, but yeah. Okay. But it, uh, it like I said, that's all tied with the bill grant. Um, the, those funds, they set the specific criteria. But is, is it safe to say that we need to move as quickly as possible right now? Absolutely. Just on right-of-way acquisition? Absolutely. Okay. That is the critical path. Okay. Typically in a project this size, right-of-way is, once we've completed an environmental process, which we've done on this project, right-of-way is always our critical path. The design effort, it's complicated, but it's normally never the critical path, the right-of-way, because there's so many factors in when we're going out to buy right-of-way that we can't control. Namely, the courts is a big thing that we can't get. Condemnation actions, we have little control over all that, so it becomes uh, a challenge. Ne Neil and Supervisor Couch, do you, Neil, do you want to talk about what our plan is right We're now? We're going to get to that okay. real briefly. Um, okay, here's another map of Sigma 4B, the project in design. Um, basically, this project goes from the west. It, it ties into our original Sigma 1 project, Four-Lane Expressway, which, uh, as mentioned, was completed back in 
2011, and then in, proceeds east, and then it ties into the project um, that is now in construction at, uh, at near I-5. So we're, we basically go through, we start at Brown Spatera Road, we go east, um, we go through the Chevron oil field, which presents a whole set of challenges. We cross the California Aqueduct, um, we go through the community of Lost Hills, and then we, and then go ahead and east and tie into the project in construction. So um, let me go through, let me show you basically what the project's gonna look like. So you can see on the, on the map, we've got it basically split into four sections. These are the four typical cross sections I'm gonna show you. The majority of our projects we built in the past, we basically had one cross section. But because this project is somewhat unique, we're going, we have a lot of challenges getting through this area. The oil field is a big challenge. We're going through a community, so we change our design somewhat to fit, the, to try to minimize the disruption to the community. And then we, once we get out of there, we widen back out to a, a more typical design. So let me show you what we're proposing for cross section. This is starting at the west end of the project. So this is gonna look like basically what we've built in the past, segments one, two, and three. We have a fairly wide median. It's roughly 40 foot um, or 46 foot median. We have a nice wide median to divide traffic and then we have the two through lanes in each direction with the 10 foot shoulders. It's a very standard design for our expressways. As we continue east, going through the oil field, you can see where it's changing, the, the median's being narrowed. Um, we're gonna put a concrete barrier down the center of the median. Um, and again, just to remind you, this project is in the very early stages of design. So none of what I'm showing today is finalized at this point, subject to change, especially this particular section here through the oil field. Um, we are working with Chevron. They've been very cooperative to this point. Um, there's a lot of impacts out there that we're trying to avoid because every impact they have is very costly for us to mitigate. So there's a good chance that we may have to end up narrowing the meeting even further right now. We'd like to keep it where it is right now. It's, f it's a good design, provides an inside shoulder, but we're willing to, to <coughs> minimize that if necessary, just to minimize the impacts to the wells. Um, you can see we've, pardon? Does the total width stay the same? Um, no, if we, if, we, if we narrow that down, well, in other words, the pavement, the shoulder, the, I'm sorry, the median width will go, will be narrower. Right now we're showing a 22 foot median. We could take that down, actually down to four feet if we have to. Not, it's not desirable on our part, but we, yeah, it, actually it's surprising if you, you think of that's a pretty narrow, narrow shoulder, but if we, we looked at, in other words, we could put a five foot shoulder in there. Actually a one foot shoulder is safer. Um, people have the false perception if they have problems, they'll, if they see a five foot section, they're, they're more likely to stop there, which is what we don't want them to do because they're still in the middle of a traffic lane. With a one foot shoulder, people will never, not, should never, normally not stop there. They'll try to get over to the right shoulder. So the, t the 27 feet, is that fixed in all the cross sections? That's 22, the median right now is 22. No, no, the, the outside. Oh, I'm sorry, that could be shrunk as well. We're looking at, all, we're looking at options right now. We're, we prefer to keep that, the 27 foot allows us runoff room safety. So we have plenty of clear recovery zone between the edge of our shoulder and the, the right of way fence. So what we would reduce first would be the, the median width most likely. We would just move the lanes in close to the median because we have the concrete barrier separating the travel ways. That's correct. Yeah, because your barrier is two feet. I'm sorry, your barrier is two feet, so the actually is 10 feet. Right. So it's twice the width as your tile one, right? The paved one. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, my question had been was the, the this particular um, picture or diagram shows the 22 feet minus, I guess, now the two feet that you mentioned for, for the, the actual barrier. So barrier. And, the, and the reason we, <coughs> we like this design is because it allows us to sweep the median with a sweeper without right. impacting traffic. Yeah. And, and I know you mentioned about, you, you know, the, the one foot uh, is preferable because it'll prevent people from 
thinking I can pull over. But to me, it would be a, a, even more dangerous because sometimes someone on that fast lane is forced to immediately pull over, not be able to cross over, you know, another lane or two in some cases. And now they'll really be out there in path of the fast moving lane. That's correct. It, so. It's the same thing. If Well, it, it, it creates a problem with a five foot shoulder. But it's You're safer. still going to be, uh, really, it's not. You're still in the travel way. You can't get well, your vehicle out of the travel way in a five foot shoulder. Mm -hmm. Generally, people are not going to pull off. They won't be able to get If they're not right against the barrier, they won't be able to get out of mm -hmm. the car. So they they tend to, they're straddling that edge line. Right. So they're, so it's almost worse because they're still, they may think they're out of the travel way, but they're actually blocking lanes. So it's. Well, I'm more comfortable having an extra four feet than <laughs> only having one foot and, and I, having I my. I can't <laughs> argue. I don't, I don't disagree <laughs> with you, but I mean, yeah. So, but. As I mentioned, our preference is to build this cross-section. Okay. We like this cross-section. It does provide refuge for, for vehicles that have okay. uh, problems in the, in the center. What would cause this one to not be able to be put in as you've designed it? Um, impacts that we're going to encounter with Chevron oil. Oh, oil Chevron, fields. okay. It's oil field. I mean, we're looking at, right now, they've got a, we're um, dealing with about six oil wells that we're impacting right now. Just to give you an idea, we're not physically impacting any of the wells by our project. When I mean physically, we're not, not up against a well. But the problem is with, with the oil wells, um, the oil companies have, or Chevron has a uh, generic term, a buffer zone they call about 50 feet they'd like to have. 50 feet around each well. That allows them to get in there and service the wells. They have, they have typical equipment that goes in there. They have to pull. They set up temporary towers to pull the well head <laughs> off to, to do service either or redrill the well those towers have to be guide off they have to have certain distances for those so but we went back and, and told them we realize all that but we can't look at a generic solution now we have to look at each individual well and what you can live with so they're doing that for us right now so they're so we're willing to compromise as much as we can within safety re, you know safety factors um, so we're waiting, and, and actually, I, I just spoke with them earlier this week. They're committed to give us the information on those six remaining wells, hopefully by early next week. And that'll help us determine what, what we can do. I mean, we may not be able to avoid all the wells. The problem with the wells is the cost for us. I mean, in, in the wells can go anywhere from a half million up for us to, we'd end up buying the well, basically. We would force Chevron, if they couldn't service the well, with our project in place, and we would end up forcing Chevron to cap that well. So we would pay them for that, then, then it goes into the loss of revenue for that well, and then the cost for them to redrill a new well in the oil field. So it can get very expensive. So we're trying to do whatever we can to avoid that. Um, it's, yeah, when, back when this project was first envisioned, the original plan was just to blow through Chevron with a standard, standard 46 foot median and we were gonna hit probably anywhere from 30 to 40 wells. There's no way we would ever be able to fund a project of that size. We were looking, uh, our best, and they were all guesses at that point, the cost to do that, we're, we're looking probably over $100 million just to look at the Chevron oil field, for this, and it was, which is roughly about a mile and a quarter. There's no way we could have ever been able to fund that kind of a project. So that's why this project is the fifth and final project we're mm -hmm. working on. We tend to push the hardest things to the end, and that's where are, we're at Are now. those wells on one side only? Of they're the unfortunately road? they're on both sides. We are going right through one of the one of the richest oil fields in California. So you uh, mentioned six, so is that what? The oil right? fields, the oil wells are on both sides of the highway. But a total of six. There's six of them that they're concerned that we're impacting, okay. right? So they're evaluating those. They're looking to see, and it, it depends how the oil wells are are oriented with respect to the highway as a, how their equipment comes in to work on those. There's a lot of different variables involved. They have a criteria when they put those temporary towers, they're concerned if those things should fall. They don't want them to fall on the freeway. It comes down to liability on their part as well. So it, it, it all, it's all understandable. It's just, it's very complex, very complicated. Can I ask a question? Sure. Th they have a 50 foot <coughs> policy or criteria. Is mm -hmm. there any rule or regulation that Caltrans has? with regard to spacing no. from an oil well? Hmm. Not as long as it's out of, out of our right of way, yeah. So it, we rely on the owners to tell us what they need for that. You know, and it's all based on maintenance of the wells, basically. 
say that again. We you rely on. Well, in other words, we're, in this case, we're we're asking Chevron if we build our highway next to your well, does, does that what does that do to your well, your ability to to, to maintain that well? And that's what they're doing to us, telling us right now. So, in other words, we don't have a criteria that says we have to be so far from a well, from our right away. As long as it's outside of our right away, there's no criteria on our part far as distance from the well. S Supervisor Couch, can I, can I add something? Yep. S so right now, Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, because I've driven through there dozens of times. There are wells within 50 feet of the Caltrans edge of right-of-way right now, today. Um, there could be. I don't know that for a fact. There, there could are. be. I, absolutely, there are. The, yeah, the, it's it's a little different, because when, when we build this new facility, it's going to be a controlled access facility. So... Um, we're gonna we're gonna re I mean there's fences out there now some in good shape and some not so we'll refence all that and we're also going to um, to eliminate some of their driveways out there we're going to make it we're going to change um, Chevron's uh, the whole the whole way they do business in that area unfortunately so there's a lot of issues that they're looking at right now and that's one of the reasons we're putting the barrier primary reason for the barrier in this section this area is for safety of the motors. It also, at the same time, prohibits Chevron from driving across the highway, which is what they do today. Um, our concern is that will not be a safe um, operation in the future with four lanes of traffic out there. We don't want them crossing that. So it's going to be very disruptive to their operations. So we're, we're looking at um, solutions to minimize that disruption, one of them being a, a, an overcrossing structure in the oil field that we're proposing to share the cost of with Chevron. And actually, there's another company in the area, Era Energy, which is also in that. They have a small section of uh, the oil field out there. So we're working with both companies right now. Any more questions on this particular section? We'll move. So heading east, now we're going in after we cross, um, move out of the oil field, we cross the aqueduct, and we go into community of Lost Hills. What happens here is um, if many of you have probably have driven through Los Panos on Highway 152, this is basically what it we, will look like in Lost Hills with this project. <clears throat> uh, the four lanes will have a, a center left, continued left turn lane, and then we'll have um, curb and gutter with um, eight foot shoulder parking through the community. So it's a pretty standard design when, we, when we're pushing a highway through a a local um, community like this. Sure. What's the speed limit? I would assume we. I'm not sure what it is right now. It's probably 35. This, the speed limit in Lost Hills right now goes down to 45. 45? It wouldn't. I know it wouldn't. The speed limit on the expressways will be 65 out of the community, but we won't raise it going through the community. Yeah, and th there is a school zone in Lost Hills too, and that's it's 25. It's a school crossing, right. So, yeah, we certainly would not raise the speed limit. I mean, and we would probably, have, once this project was done, we'd probably come back and conduct speed surveys, you see, and, and just for safety reasons. Okay, moving through the community of Lost Hills, and we go the last section, and you can see we kind of we widen back out a little bit, and this section ties in with the project that's currently in construction right now. Again, you can see in this project, as we did with our this section with the, that matches the section on the west end, we have a nice wide, we have a wide, or not a little bit wider median, but we have the wide shoulders <coughs> that accommodates drainage. These are all going to be. Um, there'll be drainage ditches out there to accommodate runoff, and we have plenty of space for what we term clear recovery, which allows vehicles room to, to over to correct without um, hopefully going through a right of way fence in that area. Let me back up a little bit and go through some of the things. Um, On the sidewalk? Uh, well, that's what I'm, I was going to ask you there. Yes, that's the so sidewalk. So you're going to put curb and gutter and sidewalk yes. for the pedestrians to be able to walk along that freeway yes. area? 
We're going to improve the safety. Through, that's through the community. Okay, good. Basically, and that's, for, that's from the aqueduct all the way through to Los Hills Boulevard, which is signalized right now. Okay. That's what I term the community, the, the business district for Los Hills. Okay. I believe there's sidewalks on the south side that was done in a previous project. Mm -hmm. We'll probably, because the grade difference is going to be somewhat, it'll be a little bit different, we'll probably have to re we'll replace those with new sidewalks and then put okay. sidewalks on the north side as well. Okay, but it, they'll be able to walk through the, the community, not just as far as the signals, because isn't there um, s residential or business or something beyond the, s the lights? Um, on the north side, you have the park right there. Right. And then on the south side, there, is a, there might be a business or two, but our sidewalks will stop at the signal. That's our, that's our current design right now. Because mm -hmm. our right of way goes out, we, we no longer have the, the curb and gutter once we, once we, past get, the lights. we get east of the, of the uh, signalized intersection. Sure. Neil, can you re repeat the question into the microphone? Sure. Let me Thank back you. up and show you the get back to where the plan. Is. So the question was from the folks over here. They were concerned about the safety to the to the community, basically through the through the community of Lost Hills, the business area. Um, right now, we have there's an existing school crossing at the first intersection just east of the aqueduct. I think that's Bruning. Um, We'll maintain that school crossing. We're looking at um, a couple options, either signalizing a full signal at that intersection. Uh, at this point, um, I'm not very certain that, that would meet our warrants. At a minimum, we would probably end up doing, for safety improvements, we would put a pedestrian activated flashing beacon there. In other words, there'll be flashing beacons with pedestrian crossing signs and for the school crossing, so if the students walk in the morning, walk up to the sign, push the button, that would activate the sign. It's a flashing beacon to alert motorists that there is a, an active crosswalk in the area, or people are going to cross here. Um, we, we, we will look at a full inter or full signalized intersection like we have down at the Los Hills Boulevard, but that's a pretty minor street, so I don't think that's going to probably going to meet our warrants for a signal. We just can't go and put a signal wherever we think. Um, we where we want to, we have to meet certain warrants criteria. Because if you can, if you put signals in places where they're not really warranted, they can make them a liability for the state. Um, so we can't, and we can get sued on that just as well we, we didn't have a signal there. So we have to be very careful in, in how we treat um, signalized intersections. Um, something else as far as pedestrian safety, I don't know if you're aware of this, but down at the um, east end of town at Los Hills Boulevard where the park is, uh, the wonderful company is considering looking at our, they've given a proposal to us about building a pedestrian overcrossing oh. to cross over the highway which would be a huge improvement for safety um, so they've they've come to us they we've given them our design at that location so they're looking at right now the feasibility of building a pedestrian overcrossing so i can't tell you if, if they're going to go forward or not but they're certainly um, they've put a lot of time into to this proposal at this point. They, I have seen some preliminary drawings for that. Um, basically what their, their plan would be to, would span our entire right-of-way and then they would touch down beyond, outside of the state right-of-way. So it would really have <coughs> virtually no impact to the, to the highway itself. If there's school traffic, are you providing for bicycle access? Well, they would be able to use, in other words, we're not providing bike lanes. There are no bike lanes there now. They would be able to use, we do have at that school crossing at Bruning, there is a sidewalk off of the actual alignment and it, it goes, ties into the bridge that crosses the aqueduct and it goes over to the school west of the aqueduct. So there's a separate little sidewalk off of the actual highway right now to allow pedestrian and bicycle access for that. That would be maintained. Um, in the future, with the sidewalks, they could still use, they'll have the shoulder to ride on, or they could use a sidewalk in that community. Point. But there won't be a designated bicycle lane. In they the community. There is parking in the shoulder, though. We will allow parking, so that, right. So I don't know what the, cri I don't know how, if there's a lot of bicycle traffic in the area. I'm not sure we haven't got any information on that at this point. We can look into that. <coughs> we just don't have, uh, at this point, we don't have the right-of-way to go through that area, to, 
provide additional bike lanes for that as well. The the curb gutter sidewalk is that all new? It'll all be brand new for this project. So right now there's I believe there's uh, and the right of way is at the back of sidewalk. The right of way goes be just just beyond the back of sidewalk. The state will maintain the sidewalk and the curb and gutter. So you've you've got three or four feet back of sidewalk to the right of way. Uh, maybe a two or three feet that allows us space to, in other words, the the allows us to to touch down with the original or an existing grade. The existing grade may not be at our same elevation as the sidewalk, so we need what we call a catch point to, for that to run off, to blend in with the existing grade at that point. It may be relatively, it could be it could match our sidewalk, but, but it may not. So we need a little bit of space beyond. In other words, we just can't cut a right away off the back of sidewalk. We don't want to drop off there, and it be it be a safety issue from our point of view. We want to make a, some kind of a transition from the edge of that sidewalk, and then we'll work on the on this the north side where majority of the businesses are located in that area. We'll work with them to try to to come up with um, some adjustments to tie into their existing sidewalks or their buildings. Right now, we're trying to uh, there's a, maybe one or two buildings that may be impacted by the project. We're not really sure at this point. We haven't finished all the design in that location. Um, we will be taking some parking spaces off-street parking for that existing businesses so we will be working with the business to see what we can do to mitigate for that loss of parking they will have the shoulder parking in the future curbside but they are they may be losing several parking spots so they have they already have developed parking lots that will be taking to move the to actually move the, the um, widening to the north do you ever go with a wider sidewalk typically not in this location with six foot be our standard sidewalk for this it is a business district and a school zone. You don't go with the wider sidewalks? We could look into that. We typically don't. Um, pretty much for our standard would be the six-foot sidewalk. That would also help with the bicycles, I would think. Yeah. Possibly. You could go with an eight-foot sidewalk. Right. We could certainly look into that. We think also have utilities to deal with in it, so it becomes more problematic, too, where we're going to put the utilities. But um, right. we could... We could look at the, the difference in grade elevation to see what, you know, if we, if we went in a couple extra feet, how much more would we need, you know, behind that sidewalk to match up. But there is some, certainly is some potential to, to evaluate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I just want to echo um, Mr. Smith's comments. I think if we're going to go in there, we, we might as well try to, try to um, encourage the biking culture in that community. Um, so, I mean, I, I agree with his questioning. Um, if we're like, like I mentioned, if we're going to go in there, we might as well consider that and take that in consideration for the families in Los Hills. So I, I'm just going to, I just wanted to speak up on behalf of the community I, of Los I know, Hills. I appreciate the comments. And we certainly could consider that. We just don't, like I say, we haven't done that detailed design as far as we don't know how um, that's going to impact the businesses. I mean, we, I certainly agree with you. I don't disagree that eight foot it would be helpful, beneficial to the community. But if it means um, if it means a loss of a business, then we would we might think otherwise than that, because we're fairly close, like I said, to one or two businesses, and we have to be able to get from our sidewalk back down to what they have in their business. So, if it, so, but uh, certainly something to consider. Uh, it's a very good comment. So we we certainly will consider that. I appreciate your comments on that. Sure. Only one, only there's only one school crossing in the community, and that's at Bruni. So we would maintain that. We would encourage them to, to use the school crossing <coughs> or to go down to the signal crossing. Right. We we don't really want to put crosswalks <coughs> throughout the community because then we're going to increase we're going to increase them to encourage them to use that. And we really don't. We don't want people crossing at every intersection. That the biggest thing is safety, and then, then again, there again, and it impedes the operation of the of the highway. We don't want all those large trucks coming through there. Anybody driving through there having to stop at every other intersection. Um, so, so like I said, we're we we don't intend at this point to provide any of the crosswalks other than the school crossing. And then the crossing, the signal at the signalized intersection, which is at the east end of town. 
Does the school crossing have a pedestrian activated light, like a hawk signal or something? That's what we're going to propose. Well, we're looking at, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're looking at the potential to, to fully signalize the intersection. It's a T intersection right now. And I, right now, I, I have my doubts whether that would meet our warrants for a full signal. Something in lieu of that we could propose would be a, a, a pedestrian activated signal for the cross. In other words, students walk up to that, they push a button, the, the flashing beacon goes off, there'd be signs alerting motorists, hey, because they're not going to see that thing flashing all the time, so that's a, that hopefully would get the motorist's attention that someone's using that crosswalk. It would actually go to a red, would it not? No. It's a yellow flashing beacon. We're not going to stop traffic. In other words, it's not designed to stop traffic. It's designed to warn motorists pedestrians are using the crosswalk. You could stop traffic. Well, well we could. Uh, we uh, Mr. Chairman, can I? It's very similar to the, uh, it is exactly like the signal we put in or the county put in on Morning Drive or State Route 184. Pedestrian walks up to there, pushes the button, the lights fly, uh, flash very brightly, gets the motorist's attention, and the state law is once there's a pedestrian in that signal, they have to stop. I understand. I believe the one that we're putting on 24th Street actually goes to red. And I, I, I just I'm seen one recently that. that actually goes to red, and I've seen them in L.A. that actually go to red, that are pedestrian activated. Yeah. Uh, Cal Caltrans is looking into it. The ones yeah. I have seen I, just I haven't seen a red. I'm not saying they don't. I just have never seen a red one like that. Usually we don't, we don't allow, um, we wouldn't allow the pedestrians to, to activate a red stop light on a, on a highway. Mm -hmm. It would be a, a full signal type intersection. Mm -hmm. But... I we believe certainly look into that. I, like yeah. I said, FHWA I has approved that. <laughs> I don't doubt that. I d I've never seen one. That's all I'm saying. And, and we could certainly look into that potential. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, uh, in Delano, we uh, received a grant, and we have those at many residential crossings. And it's exactly what Aaron mentioned as to it's very, very bright, and the sign itself is like a, the lime color. I understand. But um, I can tell you with uh, kids, you'd be stopping traffic a lot because some kids are walking by and they just press the button and they're not crossing. They're just, you know, I, I see it throughout the town, especially when school's out. You know, they just do it. They just press the button. And that means it would flash and then turn red and you'd be continually stopping traffic on a road that is probably going to be busy. That would be my concern. You know, and then pretty soon somebody's not going to pay attention to it and now you have the worry that, you know, did they call Wolf too many times, and some of your drivers may not pay attention to it? That would, you know, that would be my comment on that. It, it is one of our concerns as well. Yeah, thank That's you. Yeah, but we will certainly evaluate that. Like I said, we haven't gotten as far as the signal placement. That's evaluated by our traffic ops people. So we haven't got. We're still in preliminary design. So they'll evaluate the, the warrants for a full signal and or a flashing beacon. I can mention to them that that you know. I, do we have the option to put in something like that? Or, or if we can't, why can't we? What, what's prohibiting that? Thank you. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. I, yes. I have a question. If, if you're still evaluating that, once you do find out where you are going to put these, is the public going to be able to make another comment and say, you know, why are, why are you only, you know, using this at, the, at this crossing or... Is there going to be another opportunity? We're going to go out and have a public meeting in Lost Hills on March 18th to, to present the project. Similar to this, actually, we're going to have larger plans out for the public to, to take a look at, and we can explain what we're doing in the, in the overall project as well as directly in Lost Hills. So will you be able to come back to, to this board in six months and let us know where you are on that project? We can certainly come back. I can tell you that um, in in six to nine months, we won't be in a very good position to make any further changes. Because as I mentioned, this project is on a very, very fast track. And, and can come back in oh, months, I can certainly come back. <laughs> I can come back whenever you folks would like me to I can give you an update at your discretion. I'd be more than happy to come back anytime. Yeah, we can come back. At, three months, six months, whatever your board would like, and let you know where we're at, our processes, and, and what, we've, what we decided on as far as, you know, signal placement and things of that nature. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. 
I make a suggestion? Aaron has heard the concerns, and I would like just to ask you to invite them back when you think it's appropriate for us, for us to hear that again. But I don't want you to leave here. I want to reiterate, or let me ask the question. We don't even get to think about any of these width of the sidewalk or anything unless we get the right of way. Correct. So that's the priority. And describe for us what's being done to expedite that. Okay. We can jump ahead a little bit, sure. Because I think we were supposed to be done about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me move on. That's not all your fault, by the way. We Thank you. <laughs> Let me move on here, too. We'll, I can wrap this up fairly quickly. Okay, project challenges. We've, covered, we've talked a little bit about this already. Um, avoiding Chevron era and the, their oil field facilities are one of our biggest challenges. Um, we're having to build, as part of this project, we'll build a new parallel bridge over the aqueduct. Um, DWR, which is the Department of Water Resources, controls the aqueduct. They own it and they maintain it. Um, probably a lot of you know they have a huge problem in, in Central Valley called subsidence. The aqueduct is actually sinking throughout the valley. Um, so they're under, so that presents a whole new set of problems for us because they're going to modify the aqueduct over the next probably four to five years, which will affect every one of our structures over that. So we're having some challenges getting them to tell us how high they want our bridge to be built. So that's, that's causing us some delays right now. Um, we have four utilities going through this project, PG&E, um, Los Angeles Water District, um, Southern California Gas, and Frontier Fiber Optic Communication Line. Those will all have to be relocated either at, at a portion of the project or pretty much the entire project. So that's going to create a lot of issues for us to deal with. And the fourth and most um, critical problem or challenge we have is right away acquisition. One of the things, because we're actually behind now to, to acquire right away from our normal typical schedule, we're going to work with our, we're entering into an agreement with the Kern County to ask them to take over the acquisition for this particular project. Um, the main reason we're doing that is because they have more flexibility than the state does. We know we're going to have some condemnation activities or actions on this project. Um, the state has to go, when we condemn a property, we have to get approval from California Transportation Commission. The commission only meets every two months. So we're, we're limited on, on our approaches and there's a lot of things that have to be done prior to each meeting to get ready for a particular parcel for condemnation. On the other hand, we go to Kern County, uh, they do the same process, but they take their condemnation actions through the Board of Supervisors, which meet twice a month. Therefore, they have a lot more flexibility than we do when it comes to condemnation. They can actually hire additional staff or they can contract out to get additional staff if they, if they feel the need to expedite the right-of-way acquisition process. So we're very confident we're, we can work in agreement with the county to get them on board to, to expedite our acquisition process. Because that's our most critical path for this project, is acquiring the property. So we're working on that right now. Um, moving on real quick to community involvement. I think I mentioned this, we've, we've been working with a wonderful company um, at their proposal for the um, pedestrian overcrossing at the east end of town. As I, meant, I just mentioned, we're, we're working with the community groups. We have a meeting scheduled with the community action group in Los Hills for March 18th, which is a few weeks off. At that, it's the, one of their regular meetings. At that meeting, we're going to attend, have project plans out and uh, on display and be able to talk to the community and try to explain to them what we're doing, why we're doing it, and so they can see the impact to the community up front and ask for any questions or comments they may have on the project. Because um, typically this project, we, we typically do that through the environmental process, but because this environmental process for this particular area was done on a corridor, was completed 14 years ago. So it's been a long time that anybody in this particular area has actually seen plans for this project. So we felt it only appropriate that we go back out and engage the community on what we're proposing. Give them a chance to give us some comments and try to um, 
address their comments and concerns with the project. <coughs> so that's basically it. Sorry, when we're Speak into the microphone, please. With the acquisition of the right of ways delays, and as we get further into the, um, I guess, further into time, we have an allocation already set aside for that. Will the cost of construction increase to where we may have to seek additional funding to finish if we go into a legal, you know, if it gets into a, p a situation where, we're, where it's going to delay? Mm -hmm. Would we be able to complete the project to say a year from now or several at some point in time later if we can eventually get uh, um, you know the property as you mentioned uh, because I'm assuming construction costs increase as, as we as in we go through time yes they do any delay to our projects typically mean increased costs typically not always but typically oh. what one process <coughs> we're using we're considering now because we know we're we have a very tight window to, to acquire all the right away is um, we may look at phasing the project in other words the concern or the criteria for the grant the bill grant money is that we sp we obligate those funds so if we have a portion of the project ready to go by their to meet their time frame criteria and we can allocate that full amount in that particular phase then we may choose to do that. Because our big concern at this point is that we don't want to jeopardize those funds. If we don't obligate the funds based on their criteria, the funds go back to the Fed, so we lose that. And so we, we really can't afford to do that. So we'll do whatever we can to make sure we can obligate those funds based on their time frame and build the pro and at least build a portion of the project. And, then as, and you're right, if, if we do that, it could mean additional funds for the remainder of the project. To, to complete the rest of it. That's in any of our projects, they're very time sensitive. Right? So any delays um, could, not always, but can result in increased costs. It's always a problem we have to deal with. Um, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, is we have a representative both from uh, McCarthy's office and from uh, T.J. Cox's office here, and they're hearing, you know, it sounds like we're a little stressed for the time that timeline they're putting on us that maybe we can reach out to them to talk about any kind of flexibility because you know this is a major project and I'm mainly talking to them versus you that that you know you're talking about well if you don't get it done by this time you lose the funding but it's it's a, a safety project also and we want all these bases covered that some of us have commented on and I would think that would be something that they would want to look at as far as extension of time, if necessary, on the funding. Uh, so we if certainly you'll take would that back to those offices. <laughs> we would certainly welcome that that intervention, but unfortunately, the way the, the the Fed program works, the COG was fully aware of the criteria when they asked for the money. Um, it's it's very clear. Um, so there's really, we don't have a good excuse to be honest with you. We know we knew not we the cog knew up front other uh, uh, the criteria meant um, they were we will do our very best to make sure we do not lose those funds like I said we were look at the worst thing or not the worst thing what uh, what we would do if we got to the point where we weren't going to be able to get the right away for the entire project then we would look at phasing we have options we don't have in other words we're going to go forward with the project as proposed today we have until probably the close to the end of this year to decide if we want to if you want to phase the project the feds are working very closely with us they're very cooperative and they understand the problems that the DOTs face with these types of projects and they realize that the majority of the cogs go out and get this money knowing that the schedule is very very tight so they're so I, I'm very confident we're, we will be able to work out a solution where we will not lose the funds whether we have the LA right away or not I'm, I'm confident we will have at least a sufficient enough project to build that will allocate all the funds in that so we don't lose anything okay because from what I kept hearing was is you know <laughs> that chance of losing the funding was a possibility but so but you're saying it's the commitment of maybe their share of the funding versus the share that comes from cotton right it's it's the, that first. The, the criteria is we need we at the very minimum, we might have a project that we can spend 17.5 million. 
because we would go and get all of their funds, obligate them, and go out to construction. That would be the worst case scenario. Ideally, we'd like to go the entire project all in one shot. I would call it phase B yes. <laughs> versus worst case scenario. But, but I can assure you um, <laughs> the department will do everything in its powers not to lose those funds because we want this project built as just as bad as everybody else. It's, it's the fifth, the final project in this 33 mile corridor. Um, and we're just as anxious as everybody in this room is to get this project built. It's a, it's a huge safety improvement, um, increases capacity of the project, and it's long overdue. Any other questions? Could you open there? Not that I'm aware Can of. Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, the question was um, folks from Los Angeles asked during the original design back in the early 2000s did we look at an alternative that went, went over Los Hills, an elevated freeway, or underground? Um, I was not involved in the project. I can pretty fairly accurately say no. Those are very, both very costly proposals that. It just would not pencil out from a, a cost proposal for something. Um, typically, we, we might consider something like that if we're trying to avoid something. Um, I, I'm sure we did not look at something that, that kind of detail. Too costly. Going underground would mean we would have, we'd be constantly having to um, or provide pumps to, to remove the water, and that's a very costly and maintenance, a lot, adds a lot of maintenance costs to the project. Going over again and um, building a structure is significantly more costly than building an act grade road. Um, so it, it didn't, what we were, what we were trying to do, um, something like that would not pencil out from a cost perspective. It just, we wouldn't be able to build, a, to, build a, to fund a project of that nature in this particular area. Be very, very costly. Thank you. Supervisor Couch. Thank you. <coughs> Now's probably a good time let me give you a, a quick report and just say that our public works director has been meeting and speaking a lot with Aaron and um, we are going to take this on and we've I think we've got someone in mind to hire I think he just retired from the city of Bakersfield yes. and he did all the acquisition for the West Side Parkway so he knows how to do that uh, he's done hundreds of them now but it would be helpful for me in this process if the board this board would sort of reaffirm our commitment to finishing 46. So I asked Aaron to draft up a sample um, resolution that I would ask that, I'm going to pass out here, that I would ask if you could bring it back for us to, really just reaffirming, reaffirming our policy to finish 46. And then uh, I would also ask that each of your councils or boards um, reaffirm something similar with you know your name inserted into that so that everybody knows it's it's a priority and it would be helpful for me and for supervisor scrivener when we're trying to convince one other at least one of mm -hmm. our colleagues to uh to go along with this um so i just ask that we'd appreciate the support thank you absolutely okay. we we welcome the local support believe me sorry oh <clears> he's <throat> got copies Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Absolutely. And thanks for the project. It really is a important and, and it's a great project and we're happy to see it getting close to the end. Yes, yeah, so are we. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So we'll take two minutes and uh, start our 6.30 meeting at 7 o'clock. <laughs> So we are going to call to order the 6.30 Kern Council Government's Transportation Planning Policy Committee at 7.05. Would you stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Roll call, please.
Garola? Present. Cantu? Present. Crump? Present. Vallejo? Present. Alvarado? Present. Garcia? Present. Cryer? Here. B. Smith? I'm here. Couch? Here. Dermody? Present. Miller? Here. Thank you. Item three, public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on the agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification. Make a referral to staff for factual information and request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have anybody wanting to make a public statement? Thank you, sir. Hi there. My name is Ryan Nance. Uh, my address is 3001 Wood Glen Drive. Uh, I wanted to hand these out. So I just wanted to announce uh, that the Carpenters, we have a new uh, volunteer program and uh, We've been very active in the community in the past, but uh, there's there's a lot more things that uh, we're trying to get involved with. Um, so when people think of carpenters, you know, they're thinking the handicap ramps and you know patios and these sorts of things. But uh, there's lots of other ways that we do volunteer and assist in the community. But uh, yeah, we just wanted to hand out some flyers if uh, if you had uh, volunteer opportunities in your areas, uh, if you could let us know. Um, we're always looking big, uh, you know, to give back to the community. And uh, the contact information is at the bottom of the flyer there. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Nance, and thank you for volunteering. Any other public statements? Seeing none, item four, consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kerncog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. Any member of the public wish to pull anything off consent? Any council member? Seeing none, items A through H, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Carola? Yes. Cantu? Aye. Crump? Yes. Vallejo? Yes. Alvarado? Yes. Garcia? Aye. Cryer? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Couch? Yes. Dermody? Yes. Miller? Thank you. Item five, conformity analysis and amendment to the 2019 Federal Transportation Improvement Program, FTIP. You don't look like Ms. Pacheco, <coughs> Mr. Rob Ball. Thank you, Chair, committee members. Uh, this item uh, before you, we had hoped to bring for uh, approval. Uh, we have received a, a request from the in U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to continue this item to March 21st, 2019. Uh, this is a, um, a process that's completed its uh, public involvement process. We were at this time just notifying everybody that it's been continued till March next meeting. S and there is a voice vote on this. So we need a motion to continue? Yes. So moved. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Caltrans report. Oh, who's going first? Okay. Okay. Good evening. Uh, let's start with the Formosa State Route 46 and 99 bridge replacement. Uh, the east side of State Route 46 is complete. Uh, they are waiting, though, for some uh, favorable weather to demo the bridge and also for higher uh, temperatures for the placement of the rubberized hot mix asphalt. Moving on to the Taft Highway 
rehabilitation project um, that is um, north of Herring Road overcrossing to Pacheco Road undercrossing. Uh, currently, for the next 30 days, subject to weather, uh, will be the removal and replacement of um, the hot mix asphalt from just north of uh, 223 to just south of Union Avenue. And then they're going to do some miscellaneous shoulder and punch list work for Pacheco Road undercrossing to just north of Houghton Road, the off ramp, uh, some elect electrical loop. Um, installation <coughs> at various ramps throughout the project <coughs> limits, panel replacements in the lane adjacent to the truck lane, and some uh, final striping throughout the project. There is some traffic control um, items. Um, all four lanes are open to traffic from Pacheco into crossing to uh, 119 over crossing. There's three lanes that are open to traffic. Um, on the 119 overcrossing to just north of Houghton Road, off ramp, and then two and three lanes are open just north of that to Union Avenue. Nightly closures uh, will be needed, and they'll do those from Sunday to Thursday to complete uh, some of the work that I just mentioned. And then, uh, but concurrent closures, uh, they'll space them, um, will be spaced by five miles, restricted to um, a one mile length. On State Route 46, which we just went over on the 4A uh, segment, um, and that's the um, between Lost Hills and I-5, um, they are working on the bridge, the I-5 bridge, and placement of the continuous reinforced concrete, um, which is cement. Uh, it's not the asphalt; it's cement, <coughs> which has like a 34. I don't, it, the life of that is is um goes on for uh, is it like 40 or 50 years isn't it i mean it's like for i'll, I'll be dead <laughs> <laughs> i just know that um so now we've got nine back on 99 in um this is um south of palm avenue over crossing to beardsley canal bridge and then on 178 it's the 178 and the 99 separation uh, there, this is what you can expect depending on weather for the next, say, 30 days. They're removing the existing northbound medium shoulder, uh, doing subgrade preparation from just uh, south of Palm Avenue overcrossing to just north of the 204 overcrossing. Uh, panel replacement in lanes one and two from Palm to Beardsley uh, Canal Bridge earthwork on the northbound off-ramp to Rosedale Highway, removal of the existing irrigation system, um, the, the cr traffic control measures, they're, um, they're current, they extended the, the lane closures um, and those will be in place till 2021, which sounds like a really long time. Uh, the number one lane northbound has been closed from State Route 58 overcrossing to just north of 223, 223 overcrossing, and then the number one lane southbound um, has also been closed um, from um, Beardsley Canal to just south of Palm Avenue overcrossing. The nightly closers again are going to be from Sunday to Thursday from Palm Avenue overcrossing to Beardsley Canal. Only one closure will be permitted per direction. Uh, the ramp closures are currently not anticipated, so don't have to worry about that. Um, Cottonwood Creek, um, or Cottonwood East Rehab uh, Rehabilitation on 58, and that's from the Cottonwood Road undercrossing to east of 58 and 184 separation. The medium work is done, uh, but they are continuing to work on the eastbound number three lane and the shoulder. Cache Creek Bridge Replacement on 58 east of Tehachapi from Sand Canyon overhead to uh, east of Cache Creek. The project was awarded and we should um, be starting that next, uh, next month, so I'll be reporting on that project as it goes through construction. I've got a long list. Uh, the Summit um, Bridge Rails. Uh, so that's replacing bridge rails on 58 near to Hatchby at Summit Overhead. They did a pre-construction meeting February 12th. Start of construction has been moved to April 1st 
Uh, they had to do some coordination with uh, UPR, which is the Union Pacific Railroad. Laredo Canal medium gap closure. Uh, that's um, at the Laredo Canal on, one, on State Route 99. Uh, they're waiting for contract approval. Should start construction in spring. And then moving on to State Route 5899 freeway connector. That's to modify the interchange on State Route 58 from Real Road to west of Hughes Lane overcrossing. And then State Route 99 between Ming Avenue and Palm Avenue. Um, construction started February 19th. I didn't have any other details uh, on that because uh, it's um, a local project with our oversight. Uh, it did get infra funding, which is a big deal. Um, and it does have some demo funds on it, demonstration funds. And we have the uh, California Aqueduct Bridge Overlay. So they're doing a new overlay on, uh, it's at uh, I-5 and 99. Um, that's, um, they're going to increase the freight load, loading rate on that um, bridge. Um, and it's near um, the Grapevine. It has been awarded and um, approved construction contract is anticipated this month, so they'll get the contractor on board this month, and I'll be reporting on that in the next couple months. The I-599 bridge separation pavement rehabilitation, um, and that is from the from I-599 junction to Panam Panama Lane overcrossing. Uh, it'll rehab the northbound outside lane and shoulders and then um, at the I-599 split to US, old US-99, they're do reinforced, um, continuous reinforced concrete and will improve ridge vertical clearance in both directions. Last page. Um, this is the Stockdale Enos Roundabout on State Route 43 um, and Stockdale Highway. Uh, start of construction is next month. Then we have another roundabout at the intersection of 119 and 43. Weather permitting, we should start next month also. So um, good news is you have a lot of activity going on, which is good. So even though it's a long report, I like it when it's a long report because that means there's a lot of money and a lot of things happening in your community. So if there's any questions? A couple of questions. Uh, uh, he spoke about on uh, 119 and 43. Um, 119 is one of the major arteries that goes into TAF. We do have a close to 20,000 vehicles a day or 15, 20,000 vehicles a day go there to the oil fields. And then also we're talking in May about a possible event at the Buena Vista. Uh, what are you going to do to circumvent the uh, or my, uh, mitigate the congestion concerns there for the morning commute for the workers and also the possible uh, event in May. Yeah. The lightning in a bottle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we had a meeting um, with Kern County um, and also Caltrans and our traffic operations and safety and then with um, the project proponent and talked to Oh, sorry, and actually CHP, CHP called the meeting, so just so you know. But all entities are working together. It was a really good meeting. Caltrans left that meeting feeling very comfortable. They're going to be hiring, um, not only will they be having traffic control and hiring CHP to handle that, they are hiring a company uh, to uh, put together the traffic management plan. What we heard at that meeting, um, is not giving us any heartburn. It seems to be working out well. Uh, we're going to continue that communication. We have um, those two roundabouts in that area, and they are very aware of that. They'll be working also with the contractors for both those projects to make sure that there's that coordination and to keep traffic away. But um, the talks, like I say, will continue, and we do. I can honestly say that we feel very comfortable. Uh, and so well, we're not seeing any any problems. Was it when's the completion date? Yeah, projected. The what? The completion date, or the projected completion date on that uh, turnabout. The roundabouts. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, ju I just had a start date. I don't have a completion date. They're so both approximately one year projects. Okay. One year. Council member. And they're starting at the same, just about Starting the same about time. March 1st. Yep. Uh, for, for information, our local newspapers wants to do a little story about that because there's been kind of a lot of talk about wishing the oil fields there because they just don't like the hindrance of it for the employees and stuff going to and from work. Yeah, I, I mean, I can understand the, the concern, but um, hopefully, like I say, what they presented to us just so far initially uh, to John Liu, who we trust, um, and his staff, um, it, it certainly looked doable and um, CHP also walked away, I think, um, feeling like this is, could, it's a doable project, but this is the event. Thank you, I'd like to see you after the meeting, talk to you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, Gail, I know we're, we're definitely working to assist the, um, the congestion, the bottleneck on the uh, northbound traffic from 99 on to 58. And, um, and we always knew f years back that that was part of the issue of congestion on the southbound uh, trying to get on to 58. Um, so does the traffic study show that the congestion on the northbound side getting on, or southbound side getting on 58 going east, will that improve once construction is done or do we still need to have some type of mitigation for that northbound tra uh, southbound traffic getting on to 58 afterwards because we only have one lane and so. and it's you have you have a lot of semi trucks trying to compete with cars on that one lane separate from what's happening up ahead when they merge the south and northbound uh, together so, so mayor Cantor, the, the area you're talking about southbound 99 transition to eastbound 58 um, there will be an aux lane added to southbound 99. An aux lane is a separate lane just for the exiting traffic only. Uh, there's been several that have been put in in Bakersfield, so you'll ha actually have two lanes to get off. One will be, uh, one will you will have to get off. The other one you will have a choice whether you can go straight or get off, and that will is being incorporated into a Caltrans shop job, which should go into construction about 2022 it'll be about the uh, when uh, centennial carter is about to open okay. um, that aux lane will be under construction okay. does that answer your question yes yeah, so um so aaron would they be adding another lane to that one bridge already that exists the or would it just be on the uh, i guess in the opening portion of it yeah the the, the uh, i understand your question the, the there'll be two lanes that will get off 99 and mm -hmm. the bridge over uh, 99 is currently two lanes for the last two plus years it's been reduced it's to one long. lane okay it, it is two lanes wide it will okay. stay two lanes <coughs> and uh, uh, as it enters 58 it will taper down to one lane but it, all all indications are that uh, once the construction is done in the area now it will operate much better once the auxiliary lane is put in it will operate uh, very well for 20 plus years Thank you. Thanks for. And, um, thank you, Gil. Mayor Kenton, you had asked last month because I brought those maps that I we mapped out all the ten-year shop programs, and you had asked about 99 and widening. Uh, so I've got a map that's in your packet, and there there isn't a whole lot to report for Caltrans on nine um, from Caltrans on 99 as far as widening because you are pretty much complete from the county line. You start out with six lanes through the metropolitan area. You have eight lanes and then it uh, going south towards Grapevine, it's six lanes again. So your widening is pretty much complete. And the last two projects we had were the, um, the north, um, the Bakersfield um, one and um, the north Bakersfield and then the south Bakersfield. And um, so I think that map, well, actually, that's your map. Where's, is it in here? And I'm just picking up the wrong, oh, it's going to go. Why did Ryan's map get in there? There it is. It's it's the bigger one. Anyways, uh, so that map is in there. It's the bigger one. And then we g you also had what uh, Neil prove uh, provided too, talking about 46 because you mentioned 46. So, um, but like I say, it's a good thing that there's not a lot there because 99 is where at the minimum we want it to be through Bakersfield and through Kern.
Your turn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in your packet, we have our monthly update. And I don't necessarily want to go over every project because most of these projects are in the planning stage, design stage, environmental stage, or they're in winter suspension, yeah. which brings me to my <laughs> next point. Um, I'm here, but I don't notice any board members from East County. Are we uh, yeah. They're missing stuck. everybody? They're snowed in. We're, we're going to take a quick vote on moving all the Eastern current. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, you, this is your chance. Um, <laughs> no, I will say we've been dealing with record snowfall. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm, we're, I'm Ryan Dermody. I'm in the Bishop office, which is up in Inyo County, but we cover parts of, of Eastern Kern County. And it was actually snowing in Mojave today. I don't think I've ever seen it snowing in Mojave. And I was just. Can you imagine the desert? It was blown away. 31 degrees. So wow. anyway, I came over. Tatchby, uh, 58 was. Uh, not not the best, but I, I did make it over. It was closed this morning. It reopened yeah. again around noon. Um, I'm hoping to get back to Tatchby tonight. <laughs> we'll see. But that brings my next point. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but we do have an app for your phone. It's called Caltrans Quick Map. Yes. It's a great app. Thanks, Brian. So it talks about cameras and chain controls and traffic jams and you name it, what have you. Please just don't operate it while you're driving. If you have a passenger, <laughs> that's great. They can use it, but it's a, it's a great app, and I, I use it all the time. So just want to put that plug out there for that um, also in your packet we have the updated Caltrans quick maps d6 d9 map yep just because we had some staff changes uh, amazingly in Gail's office just wanted to pass that out and let you know what your area is since nobody's from Eastern Kern right now hey I'll email it to him <laughs> and then last I, I do want to mention May is bike month I know it's only February and it's really cold and snowing but <laughs> hey maybe the snow will melt one of these days and in May, we're planning to have uh, uh, some bike events in and around the Tatchby area. So stay tuned for that. I'll, I'll bring up more information as that comes. So with that, any questions for me? That's easy. Thanks. Thank you. Executive Director's Report. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and board members. I'd like to introduce uh, the newly promoted and our new Federal Highway uh, representative mr. Antonio Johnson who is here visiting us with us today welcome uh, a few more items on this report I attended the CTC meeting January 30th and 31st very productive uh, did talk about um, many of the, the uh, grants we received and future grants and I'll, I'll expand upon that in a second this Tuesday February 22nd uh, our chairman, uh, Council Member Smith, will be doing the introductions at Kern Cogs Transitions 2019 Symposium. It will be held at Hodel's. Members of your staff and several of you may be attending also. That's 8 a.m. Hodel's Olive Drive area on Tuesday. March 13th and 14th, there's a California Transportation Commission I will be, will be attending in the Los Angeles area. Uh, next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, there's a statewide transportation planning conference, and we will have staff there that's being held in San Diego. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Neil's presentation and the commitment of the county to help Caltrans deliver that project. I want to, to specifically thank Supervisor Couch for his, his efforts in agreeing to take on uh, a tremendous amount of additional work uh, in, in order to help all parties deliver this project. And I, I want to expand a little bit about what Neil said. Kern, Kern Cog applied for this grant. Um, Congressman McCarthy and Congressman Valadeo were essential in getting us that grant. We absolutely knew what we were doing when we submitted for the, for, for the grant. The schedule is very aggressive. It's it has put Caltrans in a very difficult position. They're not happy with me about this difficult position, but I, I will continue to seek grants for, for our roads, and we, we will be successful thanks to the all parties that are involved coming together, including the county, including Supervisor Couch and his staff. We will deliver the project on time. The bottom line is, is there are still peeping, people being killed on that road. The faster we can deliver it, the better. Uh, the backup plan, uh, Mayor Vallejo, is, is to piecemeal it. But w we are being very aggressive. I was very aggressive in, in the schedule I submitted. And uh, both the congressmen knew that, knew that at the time. All parties knew that. 
we thought it was a long shot that we got the grant, but we were successful thanks to our, our congressman, thanks to all of you who wrote letters of support, thanks to wonderful many parties. We're all in a jam, but it's, it's a nice problem to have uh, that we got $17.5 million for this project. And, uh, and I will commit and thank all of you for helping us uh, deliver this project. It's going to be a difficult two years, but I'm confident, Gail, that, that we'll get through it. Uh, subject to any of your questions. Oh, and, and one more thing. So the, the gentleman that, um, that Neil mentioned earlier today is, is Don Anderson. There was a recent story about his retirement from City of Bakersfield. I feel confident. I've discussed it with Supervisor Couch and with Caltrans. He's the right person for this job, uh, and, and we will get through this process quickly and deliver an important safety project to not only the people of Lost Hills, to the people of Kern County, the state of California, and the nation. That, that road is used by people throughout the entire nation. And any questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hakimi, um, I, uh, I saw the, um, the page that, uh, of literature here with regards to the new Green Deal that was recently proposed. And I noticed at the very bottom, and I don't know if this is something that obviously may have happened before, um, our governor decided to uh, derail the high-speed rail, um, or what's happening with that. Can you give us an update, if any, on what's happening with high-speed rail? I'll give it a shot, Humorous Mayor Cantor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th there's been literally dozens of articles that y all of you have seen and stories in the last few weeks. I, I watched the State of the State address. I thought um, th the governor, uh, I appreciated his candor about uh, the project being behind schedule and over budget. It was something as, as a professional engineer who's been involved in transportation for over 30 years, everyone uh, who works in that industry knew they were behind schedule and, and knew they were over budget. It wasn't a surprise to me, but it was very refreshing to hear that come out of the governor's mouth. What I took his remarks to mean was that he was scaling back the project to uh, Bakersfield to Merced, uh, and you know the uh, back and forth he's gotten into with the administration. The, the administration, the, the Federal Rail Administration recently wrote a letter in the last couple of days uh, threatening to take away about a billion dollars. Uh, that, that's exactly the scenario that we're talking about on 46. If you don't deliver a project uh, within the scope and s schedule uh, that you promise, you risk losing those federal funds. So th that was not a surprise, and that is, is not out of line, in my opinion, as someone who's worked in this field for well over 30 years. And the discussion we had earlier about 46 um, is a almost identical situation with a separate federal agency, both DOT agencies. Uh, and, and we will not get into the situation that high-speed rail got into, I will assure you, on, uh, on 46. Does, does that answer your questions? Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Gamey. So Council Member, member Cryer, we, we will, we, we are, uh, we are not going to jeopardize that 17.5 million, but like Neil said, we, we will um, we will use um, we use we'll we'll use unconventional methods to deliver the project that may cost a little more than a conventional, say, five-year delivery program. So, so we are consciously going to spend a little bit more money going through the county, hiring consultants that can deliver quickly, having the the resolutions of necessity go through the county and, and hiring uh, firms that can uh, help us deliver quickly uh, in, in order to not jeopardize that $17.5 million. Any other comments? Uh, yes. Erin, uh, uh, I just want to say that I think I'm a little more uh, relieved and a lot more comfortable knowing that uh, Neil's comment about 
it's not that we have to deliver that project by that deadline. It's that we have to uh, allocate and use the funding. And like you said, if it's in phases, the last phase would be maybe our funding, but the first phasing of it, we're going to be using up as much of that $17.5 million so that we're able to not lose the money. Well, from uh, what let you're let me be clear again, Mayor Vallejo. What, what Kern Cog committed to, Kern Cog is the recipient of the $17.5 million. And, and what we committed to, to the federal government, was to deliver the entire project uh, by, s have the entire project ready to go by September of 2020. To go. Not ready to go to construction. It will take oh, okay. several months to, to bid the project and get a contractor on board. So Neil's, Neil's schedule was, was accurate. Construction is likely to start in early 2021. I think Neil said March. Th that is our plan. Th th that's what we put in writing, said we could do. I knew it was aggressive. All parties knew it was aggressive. In fact, people said I was crazy to submit this. Uh, but what's done, it's done. Like I said, it, it is a nice problem to have. There was only three, pro three areas of California that got that money. We have to continue to thank Congressman McCarthy for his efforts. He personally was involved. So, so that is the schedule. Wh what Neil presented is a backup plan if, if, that, uh, if we cannot deliver on that. If we have to go to that plan, I will certainly let you know. Neil will be back. Uh, but that is not, uh, not my goal. That's my, not my preferred course of action. My preferred course of action is to deliver the project on time as quickly as possible the entire project. If we have to go with a backup plan, we will negotiate with the Federal Highway Administration into um, an alternative way to deliver the project, which would likely be uh, smaller pieces, maybe deliver the bridge uh, in one piece, the widening, say, through the, uh, through the community as a separate piece. We, we could break it up into a variety of pieces, but those are all um, less desirable courses of action than the, the preferred course of action, which is to deliver the entire five-mile project in September of 2020. Can I Thank add you. Something? I can appreciate that explanation. Can, uh, can I just add something? Yes. Um, when my, my boss, Sherry Ellard, Bender, Bender Ellard, oh, <laughs> came out of the meeting there was a sigh of relief on her face. She goes, we have a plan. And it's, she was confident in, in what her staff came up with. And she, she had a big smile on her face. So she, she felt very confident about what the staff put together and thought it was doable. Of course, moon and stars and all have to line. But with everybody's help, like Aaron said in the county, she thought we could we could do this so i'm hoping that might make you feel a little better that that sherry was like i say uh, very relieved and confident that we could deliver this so thank you so that ends oh wait, 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 member statements any more member statements okay that meeting is adjourned <coughs> And we will go right into our Kern Council of Governments meeting. Roll call is the same. Same. Public comments, the same as before. Do we have anybody requesting to make a public statement? Seeing none. Consent agenda all items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions if comment or discussion is desired by anyone the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council concerning the item before action is taken does anybody want to take anything off consent agenda Seeing none, we have a consent agenda items A through E. Can I have a motion? Motion or consent. Second. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. Crump? Yes. Vallejo? Yes. 
Alvarado? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Cryer? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Cantu? Yes. Couch? Yes. Thank you. Next item is Kern Motorist Authority. Reimbursable letter of agreement with the California Highway Patrol for additional safety related enforcement during inclement weather. Mr. Palomo. Good evening, Chairman Smith, members of the board. This item is back to you after direction uh, at last month's meeting that we continue to work with the CHP to provide funding countywide for increased safety related patrol during severe weather periods. The level of funding that we're anticipating for a fiscal year is 25,000 to be spread among the four office the four CHP offices in the county. Naturally, we will adjust that for the remainder of this fiscal year. Um, and at this time, I would like to introduce Lieutenant Commander Curtis Foyer. He's with the Tahone CHP office. And if he'd like to add anything or answer any questions you have about these potential agreements, Mr. Uh, Foyer, or thank Commander you. Foyer. Good evening. Um, I want to first thank you for the opportunity to come before you and, and talk about, um, obviously, the weather. Um, as you guys are well aware, um, and, you know, uh, Caltrans District 9 talked about earlier, um, we were having, I don't want to say unprecedented weather, um, but it certainly has been a lot. Um, I say that as the commander of the Grapevine. So Interstate 5, when Interstate 5 is closed, uh, I'm sorry, you guys can all blame me. Um, <laughs> all right. And, uh, uh, but rest assured, at least, know that I was out there um, both this morning, uh, yesterday, and, and last week when we closed it uh, for a long time. Um, one of the things that I think applies to, to this, all the cities in the county within, within Kern is um, we have a very diverse um, topography. Um, and so, you know, up into Hatchby, they're dealing with snow, and, and um, I, I certainly deal with snow in my area. Um, part of that is visitors come to play in it. Um, and the county of Kern is not, was never designed as a uh, uh, snow destination, okay? Um, and so, at least on my side, I've got LA 45 minutes away, um, and when I have 5,000 plus cars come visit, um, it certainly impacts the residents, and it's something that as a commander, it's not something that I wanna see or, or, or enjoy, and I certainly don't want people playing in, uh, cutting barbed wire fences and, and hopping, and, and it's, that's, not, that's not safe, and so, um, what we've done in the past is um, I utilize overtime resources to put people out there to um, assist both pe the people coming into play as well as the residents. Um, and so what uh, we're looking to do is um, partner with uh, the current council of governments to, um, and I, I'm not, and I say partner, I really do mean partner. This is not like, hey, we're asking you guys to fund something else. We're asking you to partner with us so that we could uh, deploy the appropriate amount of resources so that A, everybody can come and have a good time and play and be safe. Uh, we don't impact the residents that live here um, any more than they're necessary. Um, the roadways, at least in my area, were never designed for the 5,000 cars. I can't place 5,000 cars and park them safely. Um, it takes me three officers um, to be able to manage the flow of traffic on a Saturday, Sunday, or the holiday, um, and so, uh, right now so that that's just so for information for my office three officers is uh, about an eighth of my staff so i'm a small office um and so being able to deal with these issues you know is something that i think is very important um, and so what we've done here is uh, we're working on agreements um, and i'm going to apologize to the board because uh, my hope was to bring the agreements here and and actually provide them for review um, unfortunately, I'm going to say we're also a state of red tape. Um, and I was talking with our uh, chief of finance uh, on the way here tonight saying, hey, why are we creating issues um, to we should be more user friendly? That's my belief as a commander. Uh, we're trying to shorten this into two agreements. Um, and so that is our goal uh, in the short term for this the rest of this fiscal year. Um, we'd also, we're also looking into next fiscal year, and for that, I'm trying to do just one agreement uh, with everything and, and make it, and simplify the st uh, certainly the staff uh, here at Kern uh, COG and make that easier. Um, but I'll take any questions as to what we're gonna do. It really is to spread it across. There are four uh, CHP offices within the county. 
Um, three of them are relatively small my size. So there's Button Willow um, out on the west side. There is, I'm in the south. On the east side, you have Mojave, and then there's Bakersfield in the middle, and they're the largest. Bakersfield is actually bigger than all three of the rest of us combined. So, but I'll take any questions and, and answer any questions if you have them. If, you, if I may, uh, yes. can you be a little more specific on enforcement dollars? Uh, are, we, are we talking overtime only specifically for your employees? Is that? Uh, yes, sir. Um, no other equipment or any, anything else? So we actually do, well, I should take it back. It's not just overtime dollars. We actually do the car as well. Um, so when we put an officer out on overtime, um, we do it, we, we do hours for him and we do it on overtime because then there's no pension. There's no, there's no associated cost. It is strictly just an hourly rate. Um, we also charge per mile on the car because we got to, I mean, I got to get them there somehow. And as much as sometimes I think I need bicycles because cars break down, um, it's not quite efficient to, to, to do that. Um, so we, we do car as well. So we do both. Um, and we're looking at hours and usually, um, like the, one of the agreements uh, at, to break it down for an area office, it's like 20 hours of overtime and it'd be 200 miles. So depending on how much, and, and we only bill for what we actually use. Okay. okay. Uh, do you, uh, do you use decoys? Like have a CHP car parked on the side somewhere un you know, unattended with lights or blinking lights on to slow traffic down? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're <right>. Do you? <laughs> you know, it's a great thing you're in Buttonwillow's area. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so the answer to that question is, for these agreements here, they are weather-related only. There is no proactive enforcement as part of that. Um, they are responding to or uh, it being part of, like, weather-related events. So it could be flooding um, in the area to, you know, send somebody out because we've got to monitor a, a creek that's overflowed. Um, and being able to bring extra people in to do that or, or to do something for a long term like that. Snow uh, related uh, issues with traffic, um, those would all be weather related. Um, if, and it's something I didn't necessarily want to get into, but in the, f in the new contract, uh, one of the things that um, I'll come back before the board, um, if there are suggestions or ideas on things that you believe should be included, and that's something that we can certainly work through um, you know, Mr. Akimi staff to, to address any concerns you guys might have, um, whether it be, you know, proactive enforcement in locations that have poor cell phone service or, you know, those kind of things. Um, that's always an option. Um, it's just something we got to be very careful in how we do because I don't want to have this board paying for things we should be doing normally. Does that make sense? If, if I may, one more. Certain, what, at what extent? Good? Certainly, okay. yes. All right. Uh, uh, how far do you would you extend out from 99? Because I, I, I've been out there in the snow, mm -hmm. and uh, now we, we travel out there. We try to get the highest areas we can. And you're right. There's a lot of traffic out there. I mean, there's some of the roads that are literally blocked because you can't get in and out. There's so many cars. How far would the officer or additional support extend into the communities? So uh, the officers that we're putting out there, mm -hmm have no response for 99 what's there they are not responsible for 99 okay. at all and will not respond to calls on 99 that is our beat officer's responsibility these are actually officers in the communities themselves mm -hmm. so. and that's what they're designed to do okay so i want to be very i want to be we we want to make sure that the money that we're using for this is actually going to where it's supposed to be right. um and so part of the constructing agreements the way we want to do them is I, i'll be honest i've done this in the past um and I, if i can throw something under the bus here for a minute um it's an agreement i've actually done with with supervisor couch when he was actually my supervisor okay um and it's something that we were vi yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> i'm gonna go forward i won't go backwards i promise um that we we were very cautious very cognizant and cautious on how we use that money because i think it's very important to be able to go back and say this is how we spent it. This is the detail we used it for. This is how many hours we spent. Um, we have that level of tracking. Um, and so uh, my commitment that I've talked with uh, Becky about is saying, hey, anytime if you want to call me and say, hey, Curtis, where are you at? What, what have you done so far this month? We should be able to provide you that information or provide the information to Kern Cog. That is being responsive to, to the people that provide us the money. And I think that's what's required. I think that's what's necessary. I mean, I think, I think that's the right thing to do from state government, so. 
supervisor couch. Jenny, you've been you've been great to work with. So I know you don't have the, or we don't have the agreements, <clears throat> but could I just could we make a motion to approve the funds, and as long as the agreements are, I'll put them in your judgment if they're. That, that, that's what we're asking okay. you to, to do tonight. I'll make that motion. Thank you for being here. I'll second it. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Garola. I'll start over. Yes. Crump. Yes. Vallejo. Yes. Alvarado. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Cryer. Yes. B. Smith. Yes. Cantu. Yes. And Couch. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. You're welcome. Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, uh, Mr. Chairman and Board Members. As a reminder, the Regional Awards Dinner is two weeks from tonight, March 7th, at uh, Country Club in Bakersfield, Seven Oaks. Uh, Ch Chairman Smith will be the MC. Reservations are due March 4th. We currently have 161 reservations and we are capped at 250 so please make your reservations early march 14th and 15th is the calcog leadership forum in yosemite we have a, a couple of members who will be attending and uh, becky will be attending that with you your annual form 700 forms your form 700s are 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 due uh, in the county clerk's office April 2nd. Uh, so some of you may do those electronically, but w we need a wet signature, so please print one out, uh, and and you can use this the same, uh, almost all the same information from the one you file for your organization, but you have to file one for Kern Council of Governments also. Uh, please work wi with Veronica on getting those in on time. Uh, we have, uh, subject to any of your questions, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have uh, the 30-year award also tonight. Great. Oh, oh, one more thing, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. In your folders tonight is some information about the transit symposium, uh, cash disbursements in, uh, for January, timeline that covers the next six months, outreach efforts, the maps that both Gail and Ryan uh, referred to, and I believe the um, timeline and history of Route 46 is also in there. The uh, policy alert uh, that Mayor Cantu referenced, and s specifically what was highlighted on there was an almost day-long session talking about the need um, in the future to invest in, in transportation. We got sort of sidetracked on high-speed rail. Uh, and a flyer for the uh, transition sem seminar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 30-year award, 30 years, Mr. Flickinger. <laughs> Please stand and I'll, uh, thank you. <laughs> Let me uh, just read some of the duties that Mr. Flickinger does for the COG, manages the only regional transportation model for Kern County that stimulates future automobile and truck traffic and simulates transit ridership. The model can estimate future bicycle and pedestrian trips. The model is used for traffic impact analysis of site plans, corridor impact studies, transit route analysis, environmental justice analysis, shortest time path analysis, safety analysis, and many other types of analysis. He administers the Regional Traffic Count Program and corresponding websites that include automobiles, trucks, bicycle, and pedestrian data. He manages performance measures of safety, bridge, and pavement, and travel time reliability. And he performs geographic information systems analysis for all of the above. And we appreciate your work. Thank you, sir. Ha, ha, ha.
Any member statements? Seeing none, we are adjourned.